Aloha and welcome to a Hanakako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. I'm Kili Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. Well, if you've been in Honolulu or in fact anywhere across the country, you'll know that the Honolulu Rail has been the talk of the town, especially during the last legislative session. Well, whether you are pro rail or anti rail, you're probably concerned about the cost, the escalating costs of this rail project, as well as how it's being managed. Well, there's someone who knows all about that. He's an expert who has shown that he cares greatly about public service by being a voice on many issues, sometimes controversial, but always authoritative. I have today Professor Randall Roth of the University of Hawaii's Richardson School of Law, and he's going to share some of his insights so that you'll know more about the Honolulu Rail. My guest today, Randy Roth. Randy, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm always glad to talk with you because you know what you're talking about. <laughs> I try. It's comforting for your students, I'm sure. Well, I, I do my best. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about this later on in the program, but I wanted right at the front to let you express some of your deepest concerns about the Honolulu Rail Project. Well, I'm not an expert on transportation and transit and um, wouldn't normally spend nearly the kind of time and energy that I've put into to this project. But from my standpoint, um, what's gone on is, is a form of fraud. Um, as, wow. as best I can tell from the very beginning, um, there's been more than just political spinning. Um, I think it was really clear at the beginning that this was going to cost far more than the 2.7 billion that they initially said the the 34 mile route would take. Then they increased it to three, and then they increased it to 3.4, and then they increased it to 4.2, and et cetera. Now it's at roughly 10. Now you're not saying that this is due to what you coined a phrase for a book series price of paradise. It's not just inflation and the cost of living that is raising these costs for the rail. You're saying it's fraud. You I, don't miss words. I think it was reasonably clear at the beginning, but now with hindsight, I think it's absolutely clear that they grossly underestimated the cost of construction. I think they've grossly overestimated the amount of ridership that it would have. They said that rail would reduce uh, energy costs when in reality we now know from the U.S. Department of Energy data that the per passenger mile use of energy with this rail system would be greater than what it is today with one person in one car. That may sound counterintuitive, but it's because except at rush hour, the train's going to be running practically empty. So, and traffic congestion, from day one they sold this as a solution to a very real traffic congestion problem on Oahu, but it isn't a solution at all, and in fact if you read the fine print in the environmental impact study, the city's own experts said that traffic congestion in the future with rail will be worse than it is today. Well, in our introduction now, just a minute and a half, you've presented a legal case almost, <laughs> showing your, your, your very strong well, mind. I've, but I've just gotten started. I and know. The point is that it's really, in my opinion, a classic case of, of fraud, intentional misrepresentation. So I want to make sure we've got this right, because you're not using your words in an informal sense. You know exactly what the meaning of fraud is and you're applying it to the Honolulu Rail Project. We're going to come back and we're going to talk with our guests about, uh, with our uh, audience uh, about that. But let's go back for some background information. Suppose somebody has lived under a, a, a barrel for the last f five years mm -hmm. and wakes up today like Ruppelstiltskin and sees these huge pillars <laughs> being erected across the town and so forth and needs to be introduced to the rail. What exactly was the rail project from in its inception. Why in the world did we launch that? Right. Well, going way back, Frank Fossey tried for many years to have um, what at the time would have been uh, a heavy rail system. Uh, the terminology has changed a little bit today, but when you've got uh, an elevated system like this one, uh, it would fit the old definition of heavy rail. Uh, I make that distinction because we've got kind of like the worst of both worlds. We've got the extreme cost of an elevated heavy rail system, but the plan is to use the cars that are the same size as a light rail system. So we've got the, the lower capacity, 
the higher costs. Um, the even, worst of both worlds. <laughs> the, the, the worst of, of both worlds. And um, when it was presented to the public, it was uh, presented as something that would cost a fraction of what now even the city says it's going to cost. Even the city acknowledges that it's 100% over what was estimated at the time the federal government agreed to give $1.55 billion. What problem was the rail supposed to solve for the residents of Honolulu? Well, the city gave the impression, when I say the city, um, this kind of started with Frank Fossey, mm -hmm. but Mufi Hanneman, uh, when he was elected, um, Oh, virtually overnight, he threw out the bus rapid transit system, which um, an environmental impact study had concluded was the preferred option for Hawaii, that it was far less expensive than rail, and there were many other advantages to it. Uh, Mufi Hanneman threw it out, uh, set up a process by which it was preordained that we would end up with elevated heavy rail sold it to the public by saying we've got this terrible traffic congestion problem, which we do, and suggested that elevated rail would fix that, and it wouldn't. Um, the draft of the environmental impact statement came out the day before the vote, and the vote, it was a very slim majority, 50.6, so less than 51% of the voters opted for rail. But it was based upon a fraud in terms of what it would cost, in terms of how many riders it, it would get, in terms of how much energy it would save, uh, in terms of what the impact on traffic congestion would be. You know, earlier I mentioned that the environmental impact study says that traffic congestion will be worse in the future with rail than it is today. And to most people that sounds nonsensical. Obviously it's, it's going to be better. Well, if you look around the country, starting back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, when a lot of cities were adding rail in the bigger cities, elevated or, or heavy rail, sometimes you know, uh, under the, the, the surface of the earth, uh, of, the, of the ground, um, the percentage of people using public transit in almost all of those cities after rail was added was less than the percentage of people using public transit before rail was added. And you look to see, well, why is that? There are a number of explanations, one of which is traditionally what happens, a city spends so much money on rail that they have to cut back on the bus system. And then they convert all the express buses to a feeder system to where you get on a bus just to get to a rail station. And then you have to go from a rail station on a bus to where it is that you wanted to go. You look at how these things have actually played out in other places, and you realize that how it was presented in Hawaii is just very different from how it's likely to, to play out. And in fact, we now have some time has passed. They've done some construction. We're 100% over budget so far as building, and we've got a final environmental impact statement. You look at all the information we have now, and it's just real clear that there was a great deal of deception from the beginning. And you're saying that if the problem was bad traffic in Honolulu, that we already had a solution that was preferred to the rail, which was our bus system. Were there other options and other ways of dealing with the growing traffic problem in Hawaii that would have been better than launching on the rail project? Absolutely. And I, I would just say that all of the rail critics that I know, mm -hmm. Cliff Slater, Ben Cayetano, Panos Prevederos, and long list of people who are known publicly as rail critics, they all believe that we've got a serious traffic congestion problem. They all believe the city makes to, needs to spend a great deal of, of money in addressing that problem. But they all also agree that this rail project that the city has embarked on is not a solution. Not only is it not the best solution, it's not a solution. But there are solutions out there. Uh, there are a number of cities around the world, but many of them in the United States, that are doing these, these toll roads, um, hot lanes, if you will. And it doesn't have to be a toll, but the theory is let's have those people who want to pay a toll to have a guarantee that they're going to be able to drive the speed limit. Let's have them pay for it, and that will actually reduce sure. traffic congestion on H1 and every place else where cars are now uh, oftentimes congested. 
But like I say, there are many variations on it. The point, though, is if we had a guideway that had two lanes coming in to town in the morning and going out in the afternoon, it would eliminate our, our rush hour congestion problem. And it could be paid for by the people who, who directly use it. And everybody else would benefit greatly without having to pay a penny. So, so you're saying that there were better and more cost-effective solutions to our traffic problem that were known at the time the rail project was launched. Absolutely. And in fact, the bus rapid transit one, as I mentioned mm -hmm. and, and you commented, we had actually done. We, in, in Hawaii, there had been an environmental impact statement, and it compared it to rail. And it had determined that it was the superior option until Mufi Hanneman came in, at which point in time he changed everything. So then why? Why is it that we abandon better solutions? Why is it we abandon more cost-effective approaches and soar from $2.7 billion of projected costs to well over $10 billion now? Yeah, Panos well, Prevedero says it would be $13 all billion. Right. But well, by the end of the show today. <laughs> so, why, so why? Why did this happen? Yeah. Uh, and um, you can step back and, and look at it from any angle, whether it's political or whether it's the people of Hawaii. Well, what, what, what was it that got us on this track? I point to Mufi Hanneman and, and his managing director, Kirk Caldwell, who self-described as the point person for, for rail. So there were some political individuals who drove this. What, what did they get, get out of it, or what would they have gotten out of it? I, I don't want to be unkind, but looking at it as objectively as I can, I think the more money that was going to be spent from their standpoint, mm -hmm. the better. Uh, they convinced the trade unions, for example, that this was going to create a huge number of, of jobs. We now know with hindsight that it's created about one-tenth the number of jobs that, that they said that it was going to, to create. But when you're spending billions and billions and billions of dollars, far more than you would have spent on a bus rapid transit system, far more than you would have spent on these lanes that, that any kind of vehicle could use going in and out of town during, during rush hour, when you're spending huge amounts of money, it's ending in, up in somebody's pocket. And the people who are going to be the recipients of what I would describe as excess spending, they know who they are. And they're real good to the politicians that are promoting those kinds of, of spending projects. So I, I think it, it's all roads lead to politics when it comes to explaining how So you're talking how about can, a, a crony, crony based system that benefits individuals at the cost of the public. And you're willing to I, say that's what I took really place. believe that. And, and you've got groups like PRP that have millions and millions and mm -hmm. millions of dollars that they are spending. Pacific you know, Resources Partnership. Yes, to, to smear Ben Cayetano when he was running for, for mayor. Uh, they spent millions of dollars, and some of the federal money was spent by the city, I think wrongfully, in promoting rail at the time of the ballot question. Sure. So you had this huge amount of money promoting it in a very, in my opinion, dishonest way in terms of what it would cost, how many riders there would be, the damage to the INA. You go down the long list of just the... Well, I'm going to stop your list here and ask yeah. if you'll be willing for us to go on a break. And after that break, would you let us know exactly where the fraud took place as we went from a few years ago to today. I'll do my best. Thank you. My guest today is a fascinating uh, analyst of what has taken place with the rail project in Honolulu. He's going to talk more about how it's really a case of blatant fraud when we come back from this short break. I'm Kaylee Akina on a Hanakako with Think Tech Hawaii. Don't go away. This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go! 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 
Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. Welcome back from our break. Uh, if you saw the first portion of today's program with Randy Roth, uh, your head may be reeling, thinking, what are we doing here in Honolulu with this rail project? Uh, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, where we like to say, Ehana kako. You know, there's a venerable saying here in Hawaii called a pule kako. We often open public events with a prayer. Let's pule, pray together. At Grassroot, we like to say, let's Hana, let's work together, a Hana Kako, working together to build a better economy, government, and society. And that's what Think Tech Hawaii is doing. We tip our hats to the broadcast network that produces about 35 hours of original content that gets broadcast all over the world. Now back to Randy Roth, professor at the University of Hawaii Richardson School of Law for his insights into what's gone wrong with the rail. Well, Randy, you didn't pull any punches <laughs> in our first uh, part of the program. Yeah. Uh, you called it fraud. And basically, when we talk about fraud, well, what's the definition of fraud? Actually, fraud is defined differently in, in a variety of, of contexts. Uh, I'm using it to describe intentionally misleading uh, whomever it is that you're communicating with in an attempt to get them to do something that but for that intentional miscommunication or that intentional deception, um, they wouldn't do. So if I'm trying to sell you a used car and I, I hide liabilities about that used car, or I don't tell you things that you really have a right to know, that's fraud. Yeah, I mean, our, our elected officials in particular, uh, I think, should feel um, not just a legal duty, not just uh, an ethical duty, um, you know, a moral duty to be reasonably honest, you know, to make an attempt. You can kind of lean this way, that way, and be an advocate for something you, you believe in. But I think especially with the passage of time, we look back and, in my opinion, there was intentional deception on multiple fronts. Um, I think if, if we were a community that had uh, what I'll call a political balance, say a, a two-party system, uh, I think there would be a, a loyal opposition uh, that would be saying, how in the world could this happen, and would be demanding, for example, an audit of rail. The city asks like, oh, acts like, gee, you know, it, it's going to cost double what we thought it was going to cost. You know, who could have, who could have guessed that, that costs would increase like that? Well, you look at the statistics, the data that the federal government provides, and costs of construction of, of highway projects, for example, has gone up only 7% over the last uh, seven or eight years. It's, it's, it's an unusual period of time of, of relative stability so far as stability so far as those costs are concerned. They said, well, we had these lawsuits. Well, we can document that the federal lawsuit cost the city just a few million dollars. The state lawsuit that forced them to hold off in construction for 13 months that costs 39 million, but those are tiny, tiny numbers compared to what they've already acknowledged as about five billion dollars of, of cost overruns. There isn't anybody in the state. The legislature is talking about giving them what would amount to a blank check right now. Well, it sounds like this has been a feeding trough for those favored contractors. Well, so, well, how, what is one area in which you you can clearly document that this has been fraudulent? Well, maybe I'm asking for, for you for a high standard because you're a law well, professor. <laughs> take, take for example, cost. Um, in 2010, Governor Lingle commissioned a study by an independent mm -hmm. group. She asked them, "What do you think this is going to cost?" They came up with numbers that the city laughed at. The city said that's ridiculous, and the city, you know, said these people don't know what they're doing. Well, now, with the passage of seven years, we look at that, and those guys just hit it on the nose. They were a little lo less than what it looks like it's going to cost, but they were very close. And the point I'm making is that the information at that time, 2010, was there. And independent experts looking at it and saying, here it is, the city didn't want anything to do with that. Uh, you look at the ridership estimates that the city has come up with. 
and then you check into the assumptions that they've made in doing this, and, and it just doesn't hold together. Uh, you look at the, the claims they made on traffic congestion redu reduction, the claims they made on energy savings, the claims they've made in terms of um, the problems that are likely to occur with the EV, with the bones as they get close to the downtown area. You know, when you get into the downtown area, for example, you're going to have a lot of that construction on fill land where you can't just drill a hole and put in your column. You've got to have this giant space with piles all over and then a cap on top of that. And in that area, nobody knows exactly where all the utility lines are. Utility companies, they don't want anything to do with this. They know it's going to be an absolute mess, it's going to cost way more than what the original estimate was. And so my point on this is with the passage of time, it's becoming clearer and clearer that they not just got it wrong, but they, in my opinion, intentionally got it wrong. And the problem is by the time a legally uh, airtight case can be uh, put together, those politicians are long gone. And the taxpayers are stuck with a white elephant just maintaining, even if somehow or another the rest of this rail system could be put in place for free, the cost of maintaining it is going to be an extreme burden to the people of, of Oahu. And, you know, I, whenever I talk to people who are kind of not sure on, on rail, I say, well, are you planning to ride it? And oftentimes they'll say, well, yeah, at least some of the time. I'll say, okay, how are you going to get to the rail station? Where's it? The nearest rail station, how are you going to get there? And if they say, well, I'll drive, and I'll say, well, there's no parking there. <laughs> you know, it depends on which station it is, of course. The point is that when you walk people through, whether it makes any sense for them ever to use it, it just doesn't. And yet millions have been spent selling this as something that is going to have people flooding the, the, the stations. Transit-oriented development. The theory is that developers are going to want so badly to build living units and commercial spaces around the stations that they'll help pay for the rail. Well, not only have they not stepped up to help pay for it, they haven't come up with anything they're willing to do unless there's a big subsidy and all kinds of waivers of environmental laws that are, that are there for, for good reason. So the whole notion of transit-oriented development, instead of having dense living around the stations, you look at the very first station, it's out in the middle of a vacant field now, and even when that area is developed, it's going to be a, sing, a sea of single-family housing, which is the exact opposite of what transit-oriented development is supposed to be all about. So it's just a, a long list of pieces of evidence that to me, when you put that puzzle together, it says we've been had, we the taxpayers of, of Oahu. You claim that the fraud is intentional by definition. We're talking about the energy costs, uh, the maintenance costs, the EV, the Hawaiian bones, and we just keep going down this list of things that really should have been dealt with in any planning process at the front end. So what's the reason for that bad planning? Uh, well, here's, ag again, it, it, was yeah. it just an attempt to deceive, to hide the actual costs in order to sell the rail? This is, this is the irony of this. The only defense I think the city has right mm -hmm. now to this accusation of what I say amounts to, to fraud is incompetence. Yes. Their, their defense is, well, we were really, really, really bad at estimating costs. And we've been really, really bad at building this, this rail system. And we've been really, really bad. We didn't measure real well, and so we, we've got it too close to the power lines. And so that's going to cost an extra half billion dollars. But how can they claim that? Aren't there standards for planning in, in any discipline whatsoever? If architectural if, standards, engineering standards, professionals have to meet certain best if, practices. If if we had some competition in the political realm in Hawaii, and, and Kelly, yeah, I don't care which party it is, if you've got total dominance by the Republicans or total dominance by the Democrats, they're not good at holding each other Democrats are not good at holding Democrats accountable. Republicans are not good at holding Republicans accountable. If it weren't for what I'd call the political climate in this island community of ours, 
there would be people from the legislature right now saying what do you mean you want us to give you billions more you haven't yet begun to explain why this thing has cost so much more than what just two years ago you were in here at the legislature telling us this thing was going to cost. Let's look at a potential solution to us digging ourselves deeper and deeper into pro trouble. We've got about a minute left, Randy. You mentioned the, uh, the potential for an audit. What kind of audit and who would conduct this audit if it were going to make any difference? Right. Um, the, the audit needs to involve numbers just to mm -hmm. figure out, you know, where did all these costs overrun come from, but also needs to take a look at, at the quality of management. We've had huge turnover inside Hart and the organization that's actually building, um, you know, on the board, the CEO, you know, senior positions all the way down. But also part of that audit has to be a cost-benefit analysis of finishing rail or stopping at Middle Street or doing something else, converting it to the BRT system or, or just something else. Until you've done an honest, objective, you know, independent study of just what would it cost to keep going and what would the benefits be, and then compare that to the costs and benefits of the various options, at this point in time, they're just throwing money at it because nobody wants to say, we've wasted four billion dollars which is how much sure. has been spent so far well I, I like the idea of an audit because it's not about being pro-rail or anti-rail who this could stage. be against an it, audit finding out what's going on it's about on. right seeing what the actual costs are well randy we could go on on this issue and maybe we should have you back but i wanted to say thank you so much for your insight and for your work in in public policy thank you appreciate it my guest today has been randy roth uh professor at the richardson school of law and uh, you can get a hold of him there at the Richardson School of Law. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grasser Institute. Until next time on Ehana Kako on ThinkTech Hawaii's broadcast network, aloha.